to, um, I think people will start to still trickle in as we go. Sometimes they're come in a little bit late. Um, so Randy, I will go ahead and hand the evening over to you. If everyone will go ahead and mute themselves, unless you have a question and I will have my chat box open to uh, keep an eye on. Well, first I was gonna ask how many people have been to Green Bank and there are a few apparently. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a very interesting place because at one time it was uh, top secret. It was a place we were doing a lot of Cold War uh, research, uh, largely uh, with the Navy, it was involved in uh, 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 communications with submarines. And don't ask me how they did that. I don't know. Um, they were doing a lot of other things too, for example, uh, measuring uh, or GPS, which was important from the military standpoint, uh, the development there. Um, and then of course there was uh, really bizarre things that they would do like, uh, for example, uh, retrieving or eavesdropping on uh, Soviet Union uh, spy communications by uh, bouncing off of the moon. So it was really a lot of things, but then eventually I guess the technology got to where they wanted to uh, become a little more advanced. I mean, this is my interpretation. I, if I'm wrong on this, someone could tell me I'm wrong, but uh, they went ahead and uh, essentially either gave, sold, or traded, or whatever with the National Science Foundation to continue to do research um, in uh, the Green Bank, and then they rebuilt another top secret communications facility nearby called Sugar Creek, um, which uh, thing is now uh, you can go to Green Bank and visit. And I'm going to go and uh, take us there. Start off talking about Green Bank. If any of you do get out there, it's not really that long of a drive from this particular area. It's in West Virginia, the northeast corner, and it is a uh, typical Appalachian mountain town. Um, no, well, it's not typical. I take that back. It's, it's totally not typical. Um, you uh, drive in, one of the first things that you might notice is, is that your radios will go dead. Your phones will go dead. And uh, you might wonder, well, gee, I guess we're here in the mountains and, you know, as soon as we get closer to town or we're going to get someplace like that, uh, they're all going to come back. But no, they're not. Um, that is intentional. This is a radio interference free zone. It's been that way since 1958. It was designated by uh, Eisenhower for that particular purpose. But I was there in 2004. Uh, spent a week uh, there. Uh, doesn't seem like it's that long ago, but it's quite a while back. Um, anyhow, the thing is that um, it was fairly new, uh, I mean, at least not new, but uh, the new uh, Bird, uh, uh, Senator Bird telescope, uh, the one that we just saw uh, previous to this one here, um, was had just uh, basically been uh, set up as operational about a year or so before that. They weren't quite done with it yet while I was there, but it was attracting a whole lot of attention because it's the largest steerable telescope of its kind and there's some other advantages to it too, which I'll uh, be sharing with you as we uh, go along. Um, as you come into the community, uh, such as we see here, like I say, your mobile phone goes dead, your radios start to drop out, uh, you're surrounded by high mountains, and as a quiet little sleepy town, you're wandering around, driving along, and you see all these Odd looking structures sitting up above the edges of uh, the uh, treetops. And these are all uh, radio telescopes, of which there are many on this particular, particular research uh, plot. Now, uh, back when I was uh, doing this, uh, I believe it was uh, AD, AT and T was very proud of their coverage uh, in uh, the United States. And uh, they showed this, it's probably a little bit better now, but I told them, well, I'm going right here, right here where they can't see anything. And I'm probably gonna have trouble there. And they said, uh, well, eventually we're gonna get the whole country. But like I say, no, they will not. Uh, this is the National Radio Quiet Zone, established 1958, 34,000 square kilometers. It covers into three states, that would be West Virginia, Maryland, and uh, 
what, Virginia? I'm not sure, something like that. Take a closer look at that. Uh, and there are a certain number of transmitters that are allowable in this particular radio free zone at that particular time, there are 25,000 of them, uh, and they have been all uh, registered uh, so that they do not uh, exceed these particular interference uh, value, uh, 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 levels here at the different, uh, they're going to be not wavelengths, but um, cycles, uh, uh, hertz here. So they have 10 to negative 8 watt per meter squared at below 54 uh, megahertz. And as you can see, you know, uh, it's below 10 to the negative 17th. Uh, that's, that's really low uh, watts per mega uh, per uh, meter squared for everything that is in uh, uh, 1,000 uh, uh, megahertz or higher during daylight hours. Anyways, uh, the thing is, is that... Uh, they're very fussy about how they do uh, uh, keep this. They have uh, monitoring all over the place. Some of these are, uh, they have uh, mobile systems here uh, on trucks. They have a lot of handheld systems. They have all sorts of detectors. So if anybody in the neighborhood has anything that's exceeding those quiet limits, uh, they will um, be. Uh, they will be just a second here. Let's see something. I just fixed it. <laughs> okay, How about that. Um, they'll be located. Now, uh, there could be anything. Uh, it could be a, a microwave. You buy one, you set it up, and then all of a sudden someone's knocking at your door. Uh, it might be your garage door opener. Um, it could be, well, one time they were having uh, trouble. There was interference coming from a particular home. And so these guys in the trucks come along and they go and, uh, you know, we, we, we got radio interference coming from your home. So you get their handheld units in here. It was coming from the backyard. So they went in and they put it, it was coming from the doghouse. So in the doghouse, they went ahead and checked, what, well, how in the world, what's the dog doing in there? You know, so, so I go ahead and check the dog uh, house, and they had a uh, little hot uh, pad for the dog during the winter, and it was shorting or giving off of uh, 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 radiation. So the thing is, is that uh, then, of course, the people who are living there are obligated to um, replace that. Now, uh, they won't necessarily replace it at their expense. Usually, uh, the uh, observatory will replace any particular appliances or anything that have such interference at, uh, at, for free of cost. Or they'll modify them. Uh, I'll talk about that here in a little bit too. They'll modify them as well. But uh, you can see it's fairly strict. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the advantages I'm going to tell you about having uh, this observatory located where it is is because after all, in the mountains of West Virginia, you do have a small population of people of course, and the thing is that it's going down uh, usually, and that's the way it has been uh, for some time. But lately, population has been picking up because the big marketing thing that the realtors have now is, is that you can live in an electromagnetic uh, free um, environment, and some people believe that that is uh, healthy. But the thing is, that uh, you, you do anything, you misbehave, and by golly, they come and get you, and uh, they're, they're polite, they're polite. Now, you say the rate of quiet zone, one of the reasons it is quiet is because it's surrounded by mountains. It's surrounded by national forests, which are not developed in a particular way, and as I said, it has a low and declining local population. Like, that has been changing. Uh, people are uh, uh, moving in because of uh, their health, you know, concerns. And uh, the thing is, they take these excruciating measures to control the uh, uh, fr frequency interference uh, there. Uh, we have this young lady right here, and her job is to, in fact, examine every particular piece of electronic equipment that enters into the research facility, and they, um, as well as any particular offending appliance that is in the community. And she puts it in this room and then she tests it and then tries to find out how 
uh, much interference it's causing, how it can be shielded or perhaps re-engineered uh, or thrown away, one or the other. That's what that was her job was. Now you think that in a research facility you got to have computers, and back in 2004 it was no different than it is now. So you got to have a library, and you got to have a lot of computers. And some of you probably have seen the movie Contact, where Jodie Foster is sitting on a, uh, her her uh, the hood of her car with her laptop right underneath all these radio telescopes in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Which I have another that's another I have another talk on that. Um, uh, uh, no, you, no, 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 that's all movies. <laughs> you do not have a computer out in the open in the researcher close to the uh, uh, radio telescopes at all. So then what do you do? Well, they actually have their entire library in a Faraday chamber. Uh, you have to go through an aluminum door, uh, such as we have, uh, see the pointer here, your aluminum door, you close it, then you walk to the next aluminum door, you open it up, and you close it. And then when you look at all the windows in the room, you're going to see it looks pretty much like the window to your microwave. So Faraday uh, chamber that will uh, essentially uh, uh, absorb or redirect the electromagnetic radiation coming from all of the uh, computers. But if you are working there or visiting or whatever, you want to use a computer, that's the, where you're going to use it. You aren't going to use it anyplace else. So anyhow, the thing is, is that once you get over all this heavy surveillance, uh, you are indeed very welcome. This is not like any other kind of research facility that you're going to encounter almost anywhere. It's run by the National Science Foundation. You're welcome to do pretty much anything. I mean, um, you know, only thing is, is that you just don't drive in with a car that has electric ignition. No, you don't do that. So what do you do? Well, there are these diesel cars all over the place. Well, these little checker diesel cars, you want to go and visit somewhere on the, uh, uh, by the radio telescopes, you can get a beat up old bicycle, which are many, many of them there. You can ride it out, or you can just open the front door up to one of these diesel checker cars. Underneath the mat, you're going to find a key, and you can just drive on over with your diesel car, which is a compression ignition. So the thing is, is that when you get out of uh, your, uh, wherever you're doing your project or something, your bicycle or your car may not be there anymore. Someone else just went ahead and took it. Well, that's supposedly all okay. You just find another bicycle or another car. You know, if you really don't, you can, then you have to walk. Yeah, well, that happens occasionally. But it is uh, really pretty remarkable. All of the buildings are accessible. Uh, you have key codes to get in. They'll give you the key codes. Um, in uh, one of the uh, famous uh, rooms that they have, it's sort of like a little um, canteen, if you want to call it that, or a, like a, or a lounge, I guess it's probably a better word, uh, where uh, Drake developed his Drake equation uh, there. Uh, as far as the, uh, you know, the likelihood of finding intelligent life in, you know, in the galaxy or something like that. You know, uh, if you need a key to go into any building on, uh, on the campus, they're, they're, they're just hanging on the wall. You just pick it up and go if you want. So it's really pretty remarkable. Now, you can come and you can visit. It is open to the uh, public. Uh, but, I mean, you can't necessarily go down to the instruments themselves um, unless you have a special uh, program. And that's not hard to get, at least it wasn't then, anyway. They do have a visitor center here that has a museum. And, of course, you know, you got to have a little place to eat and you got to have a gift shop, of course. And uh, there's a nice view of uh, the bird telescope, which you're going to get a closer up view. But I want to tell you that is... Uh, more than a mile away. Uh, that is a long ways away. Um, and uh, we'll see how huge uh, this particular uh, telescope is. Uh, if you are like me and you want to bring an optical telescope, they do have a platform there 
uh, and they have a protective barrier for headlights from cars that might come up. Uh, and they do have posts here where you can set up your uh, uh, electrically powered uh, tele telescopes. At this particular point, they consider you're a safe distance for the amount of electrical uh, of, uh, interference that you might introduce with your equipment. I will say that you know, when you're talking with the people researching there, and I told them I brought a telescope, and they said, what? You brought a telescope? Well, yes, I brought a telescope. And they said, well, what, what kind of telescope? And I said, well, it was, uh, you know, a telescope. It's a Maxitov Casper. Oh, an optical telescope. Is it? Oh, what a waste of time. You can only use it at night. You can only use it when it's clear. You can only use it when, you know, whatever, whatever. I said, Everybody should have a radio telescope. <clears throat> well, yeah, right. Okay, uh, let, me, let me introduce you to some radio telescopes here as we go along. And not too many people are going to have in their backyard, but I will tell you there have been some people who do. Now, in the demonstration, they show models of the observatory or the, uh, the bird telescope, which we're very proud of, and it probably should still be. It's about two and a half acres of uh, a reflective surface here, the primary mirror primary reflector. We got a secondary reflector here. We got a receiver room here. And uh, I have pictures of the uh, top of that receiver room and the interior of that receiver room coming up. They show the kinds of things that they can do with uh, the radio uh, telescope here that you cannot do visual, uh, with optical telescopes. They can do it any time of day or night, any kind of weather, just about, just about any kind of weather. If you get all full of snow, they have to go and dump the snow. That's a bit of a problem there. And uh, we talk about molecular work and so on, and then just simply the whole idea of a parabolic mirror. They have a lamp shining on this parabolic mirror, and you can put your hand up there, and you feel for that hand, where that hot spot is, that's the focus. Uh, and uh, that's uh, pretty much how any reflector works, including a radio telescope as well. Now, there are many, many uh, telescopes uh, there. Um, some of the work, like I say, uh, these are pretty old. They go back to the um, uh, Cold War era. Uh, they were still uh, quite useful for certain types of uh, research, uh, especially with satellite research. Like I say, they were developing GPS technology here. And um, this is where they also wanted to be able to make sure they could determine, you know, how long do our really detailed geographical maps uh, actually, uh, are they of any real value? When do they begin to, when does the Earth begin to move so much that you can't use it? So they've actually measured the speed of continental drift uh, with uh, these kinds of instruments that they have there at the uh, at, at the uh, obser observatory. Uh, this one here uh, on the low upper left here was very popular. Uh, it has uh, quite a quite a story behind it. Uh, it was a monumentally heavy uh, um, system. As you can see that it is in fact an equatorial mount and it has a like something I guess I, uh, later on you're going to find out I'm having the wrong number but something like a, a bearing there that's about 17 tons um, that is actually sort of uh, completely immersed in lubricating oil. Um, at that particular time when I was there it was not being used they were looking for somebody who would want to use it. It only cost a million dollars a year there wasn't anybody, though, who was willing to go and spend a million dollars a year to do it until later on the Japanese came along. Now, this one here, uh, this is a little one. Uh, it is uh, simply a vertical, um, uh, uh, say, uh, an azimuth type of focus. So you had to wait for things to cross your field of view. Um, it is also the one that was used by Drake uh, when he was first experimenting with his, you know, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And it's available for um, just about anybody who makes a proposal to use it for just for the heck of it. I mean, that's what we were doing. Um, 
and uh, but it's uh, and and the receiver uh, lab is actually underground. It's under underground to it. So now, by the way, like I say, this is available to. Uh, well, I don't know if just about anybody. I mean, the thing is, is that they ask for people to give suggestions of what kind of research projects could be done on any of their instruments, including the bird telescope. And that particular time, they were getting them from kids. I mean, you know, teenagers. And uh, occasionally, they came up with some good ideas. And so, um, you know, they can give proposal. And then, of course, if you do, you're invited to come and uh, participate in, uh, in the work uh, to experiment. But at that time, they did have a um, nice, uh, typical, you know, motel lodging for researchers um, and faculty, $25 a night. And they had a barracks for students that were $5 a night. Now, now believe me, don't trust those particular numbers now. But the thing is, is that it wasn't expensive to take a gang of students down and put them up for $5 a night. And then the cafeteria, well, you know, some people don't like cafeteria food, but I thought they were pretty good. Now they have a lot of things that you typically will see in anywhere. You're going to see the, um, this particular model, uh, scaled down model of the solar system where they have posts that would signify positions of different objects in the solar system, going to Pluto, which is way, way out over, over there somewhere. Now we'll talk a little bit about radio astronomy and where it is and where did it begin. Uh, the thing is, back in the 1930s, Bell Telephone was trying to deal with interference uh, at low frequencies, uh, about 10 to 20 meter uh, wavelengths, uh, interference with transatlantic uh, telephone systems that they had there. So they hired a gentleman named Carl Jansky, um, and he made this rotatable antenna in New Jersey. He set it up. Now, when you look at this, you, they actually have an exact model of this on the grounds of the Green, uh, green Bank, but there's a circular track around here and it has these wheels and you can then really essentially sort of cause these si uh, sides of the uh, antenna to face any direction uh, except for up probably a little bit of the trouble with that there's some vertical uh, there's some vertical things there but anyhow the thing is is that uh, he he, uh, he set this thing up and uh, he, he found out that Radio frequency, of course, were coming, interference was coming from the normal things. You know, there's a, oh, gosh, man, a, you know, weather events and so forth. Uh, there's some, uh, you know, passing vehicles, airplanes, uh, things like that. So he, he, he got those things all pretty worked out and everything. But there was something else. There was something else that was kind of strange. He found it was periodical through the day. It would raise and then go down raise and go down and it wasn't the sun he knew that he noticed that it would reach a particular apex four minutes earlier every day than the day before it had a period of 23 hours and 56 minutes now this guy was an engineer and i don't know if he had a uh, uh, an astronomer or someone to tell him that's sidereal time you're dealing with there that is star time the interference is not coming from the Earth. It's not coming from anything in the solar system. Wow. You imagine that back in the 1930s. That was pretty, well, that, that, that's freaky. What is it? He found out that it was coming from the center of the galaxy. Boy, now it's even getting cooler. Unfortunately for Carl, that when he got done, Sagittarius is, by the way, the center of the galaxy for folks that, you know, might be aware of that already. He, he published, he published his paper. I think it's the unfortunate part first. He published it in 1933, and it was a sky and telescope, uh, which is kind of an interesting publication. But that, that's where he published it. And uh, it was so curious, and it received such attention that he tried to persuade Bell Telephone to let him to continue to study the phenomenon, but, well, 
Hey, we need to make dial up telephones. All right. Do that instead. That's more important. Um, I guess that's one reason why I kind of left industry myself because I mean, you know, you know, if they're not making money on it, they're not interested. So they went ahead and told them, okay, thank you very much. You know, you made your mark. Bye bye. <clears throat> Anyhow. Okay. How come it does that? Other people began to move in rather quickly. Now here, this is an example of an individual who wanted a telescope. And he wanted a radio telescope. I don't know. I kind of joke a little bit. Well, he didn't want to be up all night. He didn't want to have to be sitting around waiting for the clouds to pass by. He didn't want, no. he set one of these things up here and there's a model. This is exact model uh, in the lower uh, right hand corner of an Altaz system in his backyard in Wheaton, Illinois. Um, now, not too many people carry those in the trunk of their car. <laughs> and, and that's kind of a funny thing of the reaction that I got from some of those people and when they were getting on my case about an optical telescope, what a waste of time. Well, you know, he, um, he used this thing, but he still had certain problems that people with optical telescopes don't have. I mean, well, they have, but, and that is, is that, well, cars are always causing problems for him, especially in a town like Wheaton, Illinois. So he had to work only at night. So he, he was definitely probably one of the neighborhood screwballs. You know, people, what that, that guy with that great big, huge monstrosity in his backyard, and he's only up during nights and stuff. You know, he probably has fangs and he probably sucks blood. I mean, I don't know. He's Who knows? But... Um, when he uh, developed this thing, and by the way, as you can see how it rocks uh, like this, and then it's on a circular track, just like Carl Jansky, so he could essentially point it in any particular direction. It's a very nice design. He got three-dimensional scans of the um, center of the uh, galaxy, and uh, it, it was quite um, kind of a spectacular thing to do. Um, you know, he's seeing things that no one has ever seen before because you don't see radio frequencies, you know, you don't with your eyes. Um, so this is really pretty fabulous thing that, uh, that he published and he put that in sky and telescope. I, maybe I was confused about, uh, Jansky's, but they, definitely this was published in sky and telescope. So when that finally got out, everyone's on board, the whole world. Uh, starts getting involved, and uh, I'd like to say a little bit about comparing a radio telescope to an optical telescope and what the advantages are. First, we're here on the left, we have a typical catadioptric or cassiterian type of telescope. It looks sort of like, I believe, a, a Maxitov or something. It has a corrector lens up front here, uh, which is not anything like what we have in a radio telescope, but it has a primary mirror which sends the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, electromagnetic radiation up to a secondary mirror, which then focuses it on to, in fact, some kind of a focal plane, which an eyepiece or a camera or something like that. And what we have on a radio telescope is, well, very much the same thing. We do not have a corrector lens up front, but we do have the parallel uh, radiation lines coming in. They are directed to a secondary reflector and then down to a detector or receiver and they're like that. So it's basically, it's a Cassegrain type of design. And you can get a little bit of a scan with these things, but usually what they'll do is multiple, just click, 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 you know, all the different um, uh, different pixels. Uh, and each one is, in fact, a, a measure. And uh, they will get some kind of a pattern like that you see here. And then they'll have a computer uh, or a, an algorithm or some kind of program that will smooth it into something that is far more realistic. And now you can begin to see things that are going on with a particular star that you would not have been able to see with just simply visible light. 
One of the big advantages, now some of you, of course, are probably very keenly aware of this, but when I'm teaching my astronomy course, or used to teach, I'm retired now, is, is that really visible light is uh, what we seem to think is the most abundant form of light, you know, at least our eyes are concerned, but it isn't. It's a very tiny, tiny, tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum. As a matter of fact, I don't know. There's all sorts of crazy ways of, of uh, trying to rationalize just how little tiny part the visible spectrum is to the entire electromagnetic spectrum. But someone once said, I, I don't know, you could probably read this lots of different ways, but if you had 35 millimeter film, you know, with all these little 35 millimeter pictures going up, line, 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 like that, uh, from um, about Vancouver to Juneau, uh, on the West Coast, um, one 35 millimeter piece like that would be the visible spectrum, and all the rest would be on one side. You're going to have the the, uh, the gamma rays, X rays, ultraviolet rays. The other side, you have infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. Most of the things that we're dealing with in this particular instruments here at um, uh, any radio astronomical observatory is going to be in the microwave or at least the radio waves like that. The radio waves will penetrate almost any kind of weather phenomenon. So if in fact it's cloudy, who cares? If you don't want to be up late at night, who cares? Well, actually sometimes you have to. The thing is, is that you can always do sky observing any time of the day or night, any kind of weather conditions and so forth. Microwaves are getting a little bit a little more difficult. They don't go through like all that well or, or th go through uh, weather uh, all that well. So the radio waves that we have on uh, for sky observing very often we want to keep them someplace that is protected from radio wave interference uh, and that is going to be down in a valley like they do have there at uh, Green Bank and so on or when you want to go to microwaves then you have to start behaving a little bit more like optical. Optical telescopes always tend to work seem the best at high altitudes with less weather interference and that's true of the microwaves also. So um, the time I was uh, down at, uh, at Las Cruces at the uh, very large array, they were testing microwave receivers that were being used for the ALMA system uh, down there. And so, um, and ALMA, well, that's a whole other story. But that's down in, in Chile, and a very, like, uh, like a, uh, at least 14,000 feet or higher, like that. So anyhow, the thing is that there's so much more to learn about the universe if, in fact, you start using the full spectrum. Say we take a look at the middle of Sagittarius. Now, if you go out with an optical telescope, there's a mess of stars. And um, this particular star here is, in fact, probably not a star. It is probably a black hole. And it has a lot of debris that is giving off radio signal as it uh, as they go in. Uh, this might be a combination of things uh, here, but uh, the thing is, is that we can look into this particular part of the uh, galaxy without concern about uh, uh, dust or uh, other gases or things like that, because in fact we have um, a larger, longer wavelengths. We can see things that are far more. Uh, they, they they were already very well describing this as a black hole back in the 1970s. I uh, uh, maybe someone here later on can talk about it, but uh, later on it sort of seemed like you know uh, in, in the late 90s uh, and early 2000s, you know, well, whoop de do, my goodness, there's a black hole in the center of the galaxy. Well, I mean, th this has been very well uh, examined uh, by uh, the uh, radio telescopes uh, way back in the 70s, as I, as I recall, anyway. Uh, someone can tell me I'm not quite right on that. But anyhow, I don't know. Now, the thing is that um, 
one of the things that would be able to see, for example, here we have M82 and, and was M81. Uh, these are uh, two uh, galaxies that are very popular for optical telescopes. We can see them uh, depending on your field of view uh, in one, you know, once you can look at them directly, it's up there circumpolar, so it's usually up in the sky and everything. And um, you, you look at them, they are in fact very uh, close, uh, but you wouldn't think they'd actually be touching each other. But with, in fact, looking at uh, different radio frequencies here uh, that are uh, much longer, say in the hydrogen uh, range, which is like about a one meter or so, um, it, is, uh, it, it is in fact a lot of matter uh, that is being exchanged between uh, these two galaxies. Uh, even though there are many, many, many light years apart, they are connected. They're massive high now looking towards, uh, I believe this is Andromeda, and it's blue because it's headed our direction. We've got um, some uh, big clouds of hydrogen gas that have not coalesced in any particular type of, uh, of uh, structure. Uh, that it can be identified by any other means. So this is probably really like another way that we can get information about how galaxies and stars form. Now the Doppler effect, like I said, uh, one I use this on that one uh, little uh, quiz thing that I do. Uh, here we have a uh, M33. It's a spiral galaxy. Now, when you look at a spiral galaxy, you can say that it is obviously spinning. Is it? Really? I mean, you can go ahead and take a picture of it, and 30 years from now, take a picture again and see that they haven't changed much. You gotta understand that, it's like our galaxy, it takes 280 million years to make a full circle around it. So if you wait 30 years, well, how far have you actually moved in that particular 280 million years? Almost not at all. So the one way is, that, are they really moving? Well, if you take a picture of them, now this is, uh, again, false uh, light uh, here. I mean, you don't have blue, you don't have red, you don't have any of the other colors in the rainbow. These are, in fact, showing that we have shorter wavelengths here, longer wavelengths here. And then we have intermediate in between. And this is telling us that it is actually rotating towards us from top this way. These are heading towards us. This is retreating away from us. Yeah, this is spinning. There's no question of spinning. Now, there might be some other ways to being able to tell that that's the situation, but to tell you that this is, in fact, a nice, clear um, portrait of a spinning. Um, spiral galaxy, for sure. Now, another thing that we get from these are, in fact, molecular uh, information. Now, back then, back in 2004, they were getting propanol and propanol and uh, some other alcohols. Uh, they were getting uh, the diol here. Um, and uh, let me see here. That they'll give us some structure, molecular structure information so we can actually find organic molecules that are floating around out there in space and so on. And then we can bit of wonder about where do they come from. I don't know about propanol or propanol, uh, but uh, we do have ethanol um, out there floating around. As a matter of fact, there's a whole lot of it. Uh, <laughs> There, there's a, uh, a very wealthy Texan who insisted when he found out that there was an ocean of alcohol out there towards the middle of the galaxy, that we need to go and get it. You know, I mean, he said, just think all the alcohol would be able to sell. I mean, my gosh, there's oceans of it. It's just incredible. And then somebody had to try to sit him down and actually explain it to him that, well, when we say that there's oceans of it out there, we, we aren't kidding if you could put them all in one place. But when you go out there, there are about one molecule for every cubic meter. And so it would take several hundred thousand years to be able to get enough alcohol out of all of that to make one martini. So 
But aside from all the silly stuff, we might wonder, recently we found things that look a lot like amino acids, and we find things that look like um, glyceraldehyde, which is a three molecule sugar. Um, and the only place that, as somebody like myself, with training in biology and biochemistry, where do you get sugar? From photosynthesis, of course. You know, if in fact we do have, you know, photosynthesis going on in distant parts of the universe, of, of our galaxy and so forth, that have since times been blown apart, knocked off into space, and are now floating around out there as residues from life forms from long ago. It's um, very tantalizing, indeed. Also, another thing that is kind of curious is, is that our illumination of subjects with radio astronomy. Um, it, we can see radiation coming from objects. We can see radiation that's bouncing off of objects. Now, I mentioned that we were listening to the Russians talk to each other by getting emissions that are bouncing off the surface of the moon. Well, we can do this deliberately. And we can do it in such a way that we can get, in fact, some kind of structural information on the objects that we're sending them to. Now, multiple scopes have to be used to this. One scope will emit a signal, and then both of them will receive the returning signal. This is interferometry. And it's, by the way, interferometry, where they're using multiple telescopes to behave as one, is in fact something that had been developed there at Green Bay. As a matter of fact, when we talk about the very large array, we talk about the ALMA and so forth. These are all basically technology that have come out of Green Bay. Now here's an example. I'm so sad. There is Arachibo. Uh, what a shame. Died. Well, you know, someone's talking about possibly financing as being rebuilt. But uh, it had uh, served a very long and wonderful life being the largest stationary telescope until the Chinese just built their FAST system in China. I understand that even though they have a very powerful instrument, it hasn't really been used too much for research yet. It's been built for quite some time. Um, and that it Really, there were some things that we could say the Arachibo telescope could do that, that, uh, that the uh, FAST telescope could not, cannot. Um, I can't say specifically what those things are, but uh, some people have been, you know, I don't know, probably just a little bit sour grapes. It's too bad that um, uh, earthquakes or, or not earthquakes, well, I don't know, but certainly storms and things like that. Um, caused this uh, collapse of the uh, aerotribal plant. But the thing, when it was working properly, we could do a thing like this. The, you can see the aerotribal would send a signal towards a target. Now, remember, this is uh, not exactly stationary, but fairly stationary. This uh, particular uh, receiver transmitter up here in the center could be, in fact, directed in certain directions, in certain directions and so forth. Um, the thing is, is that uh, it has certain, uh, certain limitations uh, because of its size. And then we wait. When that light goes and hits that target, it comes back again. And if we're sending it to some place like Mars, it's probably going to be an hour and a half before it comes back again because it's how far away Mars is. That's why we got those three um, system uh, uh, probes that have been sent to Mars just now that uh, are just supposedly just getting there just now after what almost better part of a year of going there. And you can pick up the return signal on both telescopes wherever that telescope is. This one's in Puerto Rico. This one is in Greenback. This is the bird telescope that we have here. Steerable, meaning that we can point it in whatever direction we want. And in so doing, remember, clouds don't matter. So we can look at the surface of Venus, never mind the clouds. 
Here we have a mountain range of Venus here on the right side, right upper right here, that is about the same as the Himalayan mountains in Asia, north uh, in southern China and north of uh, India, or Himalayan, as you might know that. But uh, people I know from the neighborhood always call it Himalaya. It has a resolution of one kilometer. Uh, that, that's pretty phenomenal, you know, when you have that. And then we spent some telescope, or, or let's say a spacecraft to Mercury to be able to see if we could find water on the poles. Well, they already had lots of evidence, as I understand it, for water on the surface of the poles of Mercury when the Mercury is positioned properly like that. And this are fact are uh, craters on Mercury that they say the reflective surface here indicates that it is water, so, ice, anyway. So interesting as it is, is that we can get that kind of resolution. We can take a look at different types of objects such as asteroids. Resolution of 100 kilometers. Here's Teutatus. Bacchus, Cleopatra, whatever you want to call that. Geographos, Trutatus again, Galivka. And we can get their shapes um, in great detail. We were never able to do this, you know, without spacecraft um, before. But do it, this is reflecting, um, reflecting uh, radio signals off the surface and then retrieving the return. Here we have an example of an asteroid uh, taking multiple pictures. It's of multiple pictures here. And we you notice something. There's something orbiting it. You can see that. So we have a secondary 300 meter, 42 hour orbit on uh, this particular, uh, I don't know which one this asteroid this is. They figured that many as one out of six near-Earth asteroids are binary. That may have an importance when you start thinking about, geez, you know, collisions, if, uh, uh, impacts. You have not just by one, but by several at one time. Oh, this asteroid, oh, there it is, asteroid 2000 BP 107. Of course, everybody knows that, right? <clears throat> anyway, the thing is, bigger is better. This is 120. This is the one I was telling you about. It's a 120 foot telescope. That was the biggest that they had for a while. It is, in fact, as you can see, a uh, equatorial mount to it, like that. Yeah, 17 ton bearing and lubrication oil. Uh, when they brought that 17 ton bearing across some of the uh, bridges on the way to uh, Green Bank, uh, they actually. Uh, caused one uh, bridge to uh, begin to cave. And it took them a long time to rescue it, you know, because it actually broke the, the bridge. Uh, this dish here was dropped one time during construction and it was never uh, perfect, but it still works pretty good. Uh, and I say it takes a million dollars a year to operate. So he said, if you're interested, but like I say, a Japanese group decided they were interested and they have been uh, using it, at last I heard. Now, they built a bigger one. Uh, and this one is a, uh, a, a, sort of looks a lot like the one that Gruber made uh, in his, uh, Raber, Raber made in his backyard. But it was huge, as you can see here. They're very proud of it. They expected it to go for uh, five to seven years. But after 17 years, they took this picture, and then this happened. It all collapsed at once. And um, there were some people in this particular uh, receiving uh, uh, building here, research building, uh, when it did come down, it was, uh, uh, I guess it got PSDD, PSDD off of it. But it's a 300-foot telescope. The bigger, bigger scoop that you can get, you know, 
the better sensitivity that you have. And uh, so that died. It was in 1988. And uh, of course, then there was all the tabloids coming out that had something to do with Elvis sightings and, you know, and, and you know, all sorts of space aliens, hostile space aliens. This is a little bit of a joke that they were sort of passing around uh, down there at, uh, at the observatory while I was there. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to build it like this? Or you're going to build it like this? They decided to go with an open structure here because that will give you uh, more unobstructed uh, 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 light collection area as opposed to a structure such as this. Unblocked aperture, no blockage of incident signal, reduced gallery side lobes, reduced spectral standing waves, less relative uh, 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 radio frequency interference. So it's going to be not an exact spherical type of it will be parabolic, and it has to be designed so that when, in fact, radiation hits it, it will go focus on the secondary mirror. So here's the construction of various ways. Notice that the reflective surface is made up of many uh, plaques. Uh, they're not uh, 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 sort of like one big thing. They're not cemented together. Matter of fact, they are all independently movable. And I'll explain why that's important later on. This is the reflective, uh, the, the secondary uh, uh, reflector. If you want to look at a size, okay, it's 16.7 million pounds. They like to use pounds instead of tons because, well, it's bigger. Um, it's the largest moving structure on land. So 2.3 acres of unobstructed reflective surface on the primary reflector, 17 million pounds, we said, largest move of land object. And when I say that, I mean this behind me, that's not me, that's not up front here, okay? Let's make sure we don't get confused between those two. Now, I'm standing quite a ways away from it. Look at this uh, Jimmy truck here. So a person standing there would be about six feet up, just maybe about up to that. That's, that's about how big it is when you're up close to it. Now, if you go up to the receiver room, okay, you have to understand a little bit what's going on here. I don't know if I can uh, go backwards. Let me see if I can go backwards here. I'm going to screw things up if I do, I bet. All right, well, here, I don't, here, there. The next picture you see is on the top of this building. There's actually a room up here. That's a receiving room. The uh, primary light comes down, it goes up, bounces off of this object, this uh, secondary, and then it goes into receiver horns. There they are. These are the receiver horns. And the thing is that this is a carousel. It goes around. Now, why do we have these different horns? There are different wavelengths, big wavelengths, little wavelengths. We have a few that have not have anything in them yet, because this is, after all, still developing it, still working on it. If you go down into the receiver room, in the center, you'll see the carousel from underneath. And here are, in fact, the funnels coming from the horns receiving, for receiving the radio signal. They're going into liquid nitrogen cooled electronics and so on to prevent, you know, the, another way of uh, cutting back on radio frequency interference. And what was really attracting the attention to researchers from all over the world is the fact that this is a carousel. Other instruments such as this, you only have one funnel, and if you want to change it, you've got to take that funnel out and put a smaller one in. It takes about eight hours to do that. Whereas with this particular uh, uh, rotatable, uh, uh, like, like Lazy Susan, you can have a different funnel in eight minutes. So in eight minutes, you can change uh, the receiver funnel.
Now, there are, in fact, laser rangers detectors all over the instrument. So distortions on the surface of this particular reflector by about a half of a millimeter will be detected. That's very unusual. At least back then it was very unusual. Because in a steerable system such as this, you're going to have tension all through this particular structure and it will bend and it will warp. And as you move it, can't help it, it's gonna happen. So they are constantly monitoring it. And those plates that I was telling you about have, um, have little um, actuators underneath them. There's one like that. There's one at each corner, like so. You can't see this too well, but you can see that they're all set up here where they're putting in the plates and so on. And the system, when it detects a distortion in the uh, parabolic properties of this reflector, by as little as a half of a millimeter, it will correct for it. Again, this is something that is, uh, uh, at least at that time, was a new, new, new thing, big new thing. These panels, what they're calling them panels, we call them. these actuators will adjust for that. Now, one thing about having a movable, um, a, a steerable uh, a telescope also at this uh, latitude is, is that you get snow. So you dump it. If you have a stationary one that you can't move, well, you have to find a way to get the snow off. So the various pictures that I took from underneath, there's the receiver room that we were just in. This is the secondary uh, uh, mirror from the receiver, top of the receiver room. This is looking down at the parabolic mirror uh, below that uh, of the, there's the primary or uh, shadow. This is the view from on the top of the, uh, the uh, receiver room. And it's a completely different climate there. It was chilly, you know, we were all, you know, we we're all dressed for the summer and we get up there and, you know, we're all, you know, shivering. An elevator to get up there, you got to take an elevator to get up and then various walkways to be able to get, uh, when you get up to a certain height. So what else did we do? Well, we used the, the telescope that Drake used for his, uh, when he was uh, working with his SETI experiments. Um, we, uh, there's one of our diesel cars there's a scope like i say it has just one vertical uh, azimuth vertical it goes up and down you have to wait for the objects that you are interested in to come by uh, we decided that we would take a look through the uh, galaxy for just hydrogen hydrogen one and uh, we would be able to tell a little bit about its motion and uh, we all ended up working during the day, and that just happened to be looking to the outside of the galaxy. And uh, the uh, guy that was in charge, uh, or our, uh, uh, directing us, said, why isn't anybody getting up and looking in the middle of the galaxy? Well, because it's three in the morning, you know, we forget that. So you do, in fact, have other limits, you know, <laughs> nature has its limitations when you're gonna be lazy. But anyhow, the thing is that this is the entryway to the control room, which is underground. Here we are, there's the sun. We were looking in this direction. We can look at this one Norma, uh, Norma brain arm, outer arm, we were looking in that particular direction. So neutral hydrogen is what we were looking at, which is about, uh, I forget, about a meter or something like that, roughly. As the Milky Way passes through the meridian line, then we would see this particular change. Started collecting a spectrum, uh, determine a Doppler shift for the hydrogen, and count how many gas clouds there are. So we found uh, two major, you know, showed two major glass gas clouds using an old-fashioned uh, uh, chart recorder. And this is all pretty primitive equipment, but you know, it was uh, we, we had fun playing with it anyway. 
And of course, we determined that they were in fact moving. And uh, that's it.